isn't it time we finally said, or we finally stop saying no to all the opportunities that are presented to us? Isn't it time? Now, Brad Yates, who was on this show a few weeks ago, said to us, he told us all, if we always do what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always got. Think about that. How many times on this show have we said the universe is constantly sending us signs, but more times than not, we're not paying attention or we say no. Why are we saying no? Well, maybe because I'm comfortable where I am. I've never done that before. I don't know how to do this. And there could be a thousand other excuses as to why we don't make that move. Eventually, the universe hits us between the eyes with a two by four, and our life changes to a point where we have no other option but to follow the sign. So we're going to talk about today. My guest today is Shan Kramer. Now, from all appearances, when I talked to Shan, I said, you had the ideal life. You have this great job. You're with this great company. You have a good income. You have a nice house, loving husband. You had the whole package. This is what a lot of people live for. You had it. You passed on many, many opportunities because, hey, why change? Things are good. And as she told me when we spoke, then came the two by four. So Cheyenne, welcome to Energy Heal. Thank you, Frank. I'm so honored and happy to be here. Well, this is a, an incredible story. Is uh, When we spoke, you told me you had 12 years of incredible professional success with a great company, and then life changed. So what happened? What happened to you? Well, you mentioned the two by four. Quite honestly, there's been multiple two by fours. <laughs> But I believe the first one that that makes uh, the biggest impact in my world actually came about uh, as a result of, believe it or not, a miscarriage. Uh, I was, uh, I, as you said, things were going along, corporate career, you know, working on climbing that corporate ladder. And then um, part of that, I will say, did not really include getting into my spiritual side. It just didn't. My parents were not churchgoers. I really had no kind of uh, a place to really anchor that in. And my husband and I actually went on a cruise and I was in the early stages of pregnancy on that cruise. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, two or three days into it, I'm having a miscarriage on a cruise ship. Oh, it was not a pretty sight. Most people have no idea what typically happens in those situations, but we happened to be near San Juan, Puerto Rico at the time. So that's where they left us and <laughs> said, good luck finding a way home. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. So there we were. And uh, they brought me to a hospital because after a miscarriage, you know, there's some procedures they need to do to kind of make sure that you're in good shape uh, going forward. And while I was under anesthesia in that hospital, scared to death because everybody was speaking Spanish to me and I had no idea what was happening, uh, except every once in a while they'd send somebody in to try to interpret a little for me. And I'm like, okay, am I going to live through this? I'm not even sure. Uh, and under anesthesia, I had an out-of-body experience. I literally went back home to Vermont, sat in the office, listened to everything that was going on around me, and sat there going, okay, um, I have this really weird feeling that I need to go back to where I was because if not, they might think I'm dead. <laughs> and, and I flew back to Puerto Rico and I could just feel myself spinning and spinning and spinning till boom, I felt myself go thud back in my body. And uh, when I woke up, I was just floored because I had no idea what had just happened to me. I mm -hmm. knew it was not just a dream. It was too real. I could, there were too many sensations that I felt, but that was the beginning of my spiritual journey. That was, that was my initial wake up call that said, okay, Shan, wake up. It's time for you to understand there's more to life than just climbing the corporate ladder. 
So <laughs> that was the beginning. <laughs> your, was your husband, did they take him, did, was he taken off the boat with you? So you at least had someone you knew there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I was really worried about him because I didn't know where he was at the time. And thank goodness, uh, shortly after I woke up in recovery, he appeared. So that much was really, really good. <laughs> oh. But <laughs> But yeah, that that sent me doing a lot of self-study, trying to learn about what in the world had just happened to me and, and just saying, OK, so if there is something more, what is it? What am I missing? Mm -hmm. uh, what do I need to, to find out here? And it was really kind of interesting because after a couple of years of that studying and, and starting to get this sense that, OK, there, there's a bigger picture for me here and I'm still not quite sure what it is. Another two by four came along. <laughs> I got hit once again with a layoff. Wow. And during that layoff, I was, uh, and this is still back in, in Vermont. Uh, this is where I was born and raised. And in that layoff, I kept having things start to be presented to me that I kept going, no, that's not what I want to do. No, that's not where I think I should be going. And, you know, I, it was a recurring message that people heard me say, but the big one, the big one was this whole situation of my manager who had laid me off, kept coming to me and saying, there's this plant startup going on in Durham, North Carolina. And I think you need to apply for it. And I kept looking at him and going, Vermonters don't go that far South. What are you talking <laughs> about? <laughs> And, and I would even go and look to see if there were job postings because it was a plant startup and I'd look for job postings and they didn't seem to fit me. And I'd go back to him and say, they're not posting anything for me. I, I don't need to apply there. And that little game went on for six months mm -hmm. until I got tired of listening to this manager kept showing up and saying, go apply there. Would you believe that once I finally just sent my resume there within a week, I get a call and they're telling me, we have a manager who forgot that he needs somebody like you. And he wants you to come and interview because he thinks he's going to build a, a, a job description around you. Wow. <laughs> who does that happen to, right? <laughs> so obviously there were some bigger forces at work on that one because that's exactly what they did. They created a job for me, moved my whole family from Vermont to North Carolina, paid all the expenses, including, you know, helping us get into another house, the whole nine yards. And you're sitting there going, okay, so this is a plant startup. This should be a nice, secure place to be for a while, right? Right, startups, <laughs> exactly. Right. Well, six months into it, um, this was this was a while ago. This was back during the time when the first iteration of what we called the Gulf War happened. Oh. And it happened to shift the demand for the products we were building in that plant startup. So six months into the plant startup, they announced that it has just become a plant closing. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Another two by four, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I have to admit, the universe worked very hard to get me on my path. <laughs> it was just one thing after another. And, you know, in that situation, uh, again, I went through multiple months of job search, not getting a job offer, being number two instead of number one, uh, you know, and it was just mm -hmm. constantly what I like to call flat forehead syndrome. You know, you're running up against brick walls. Yes. In this situation, we get down to, because they gave us six months to find our next job. I had job offers, but they were in other parts of the country and they didn't feel good to me. They made me feel sick to even think about taking them. And in both cases, my, my family traveled to both of these locations with me to see if, you know, maybe we should really move here. My kids got sick or hurt on both of those trips. And I'm like, yep, I'm that's sorry. A sign. <laughs> that's a sign. I'm not doing this. So we get down to the last three weeks before this plant is going to close. And I'm going, 
okay, um, I don't have a, a plan B. I need some help here. And I'm cooking dinner one night and this crazy idea hits me in the brain. And the crazy idea was be a consultant. And I remember just going, what? Who said that? <laughs> because I did not have any entrepreneurial background whatsoever. The only thing I ever sold in my life was Girl Scout cookies. Nobody in my family was an entrepreneur. I had no exposure to this. Right. And so, you know, from a logical perspective, and I do have a math degree, this was one of the craziest ideas that ever could have hit my brain. But at the same time, I had no job. I had three weeks left on payroll and I was, you know, I was feeling a little desperate. So I'm just like, all right, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write out what it is that I think uh, I could do as a consultant. And the number one thing that came to my mind, which now I understand why this was so important, uh, was leading and facilitating problem solving teams. That was the number one thing my employer had taught me that I absolutely loved was getting a group of people together who were closest to the problems in our plant and being that leader and facilitator to kind of take them through a structured problem solving process, get them to a place of being able to come up with their own solution and then implementing that solution. That was the number one thing I love to do. Mm -hmm. So I wrote about all that one night and said, okay, so if I was going to do this, how do I go about it? And I had a network because there'd been 90 people in our plant uh, and most of them had already found a new position. So luckily the managers of our plant had created a list of all those people because I had no other network in North Carolina. I'd only been there six months and I just started going through that list of people and saying, hey, I have this idea. I want to be a facilitator for problem solving teams. Would you keep me in mind if, you know, you become aware of anywhere that I could use that kind of a skill set? And it was only about halfway through that list that a gal said to me, oh, my goodness, Cheyenne, I think I know somebody you need to talk to. And she said, let me go see if he's open. And I will call you back. And within a half an hour, she called me back with this guy's direct phone number. And she said, he needs you like yesterday. And he is waiting for your call. Here's his number. Nice. And nice. That, was, that was the beginning of Cheyenne's entrepreneurial journey because I went in there use the same skills that I had acquired in my problem solving team methodology to ask the questions, find out what the pain was, figure out what was going on in the plant, and then come back to him with a proposed solution. And he, he bought it. Boom. I had a six month consulting contract. <laughs> Woo. Wow. <laughs> oh, nice. So you have the skill was already there. You think yeah. the, this is really interesting because it seems like the rug's just been pulled out of you, out from under you twice in less than a year. Yeah. And you seem to land it on your feet. Now, you, <laughs> when we spoke, you said you'd done this consulting for a while. You were very successful at it. But in the consulting world, it's fast or famine, right? Yes. Or it's feast or famine, feast yeah. or famine. You get the contract, yay, this is nice. The contract goes, okay, now what? So you're always <laughs> scrambling. What's next? What's next? So you yep. told me you worked with a recruiter and you joined a, a, a network and you met another woman with that opened up another door. Tell us about that. What happened there? That was another one of those things where, you know, I wasn't open. I was staying closed. I had this idea that I just had to go forward and, and be this uh, consultant, and that was the end of it. But this lady showed up as I was out here networking, and she was a recruiter, and mm -hmm. she took an interest in me. And she kept saying to me, Cheyenne, you would make a fabulous recruiter. Would you consider coming and working for me? And I kept looking at her and going, what? That's not what I wanted to be when I grew up. <laughs> 
And, you know, and I was still thinking, I'm going forward. I'm going to find that next consulting gig. That's all I want to do. And she'd show up at these networking functions. And again, I, I'm going to tell you, I probably spent at least six months in unemployment or no, 12 months overall in unemployment that I didn't need to if I had just stopped saying no. Right. That seems to be this thing that just was ingrained in me was it's got to be my way. And, you know, but the universe was saying, no, no, that we have a much bigger plan for you. And so after several times of seeing this woman and she'd say, you'd be a great recruiter. Uh, one morning she called me out of the blue and said, Cheyenne, look, I just had to let go of my only recruiter. I know I've got to go out and get a new one, but it's going to take me some time. Would you come and help me on a temporary basis while I look for this replacement person? And it had been just about long enough that I hadn't had a, a consultant paycheck that I was like, all right, you got me. <laughs> I'm coming. Let's go do this. And, you know, and I truly thought I would only be there for a few weeks at the most. Mm -hmm. But as I started to get into it and I saw how incredible this woman was as a mentor, she was truly willing to take on mentoring me and teaching me the things I didn't know about entrepreneurship. She was teaching me about sales. She was teaching me about marketing. She had me involved in her accounting. She had me involved in all aspects of the business. And, you know, here was a situation where I had spent at least six months saying no to a woman who actually ended up being one of the biggest gifts to me I ever, ever could have asked for mm -hmm. and stayed with her for about six or seven years Wow! and ended up, you know, she took me through this stepping stone process of going from being an employee to becoming you know, much more of a full-scale entrepreneur, she stepped me through it a step at a time. She helped me overcome a lot of the blocks in my thinking. She helped me you know, to learn all these things step by step. And it was truly amazing. I ended up making more money with her and eventually being commission only than I ever had made in corporate America. That was a huge blessing. Mm hmm. That is amazing. It, it truly was. So you are you're doing this recruiting. You sharpened your skills. You know how to match people. You learn some entrepreneurship businesses. Mm -hmm. Now, when we spoke, you said you approached the woman and said, what if we did this? What happened there? Uh, yes. Uh, one of the things that became real clear to me as I was doing the recruiting was there was a lot of really, really high quality people that were struggling to find their next job, just like I had gone through years earlier. And I, I kept thinking, what if this recruiting company I was working for had a consulting division where we could bring together a team of independent consultants and we could become the marketing arm for them? We were already doing direct placement in recruiting. We were already doing contract work as in recruiting. But mm -hmm. to me, consulting was different than contracting. Yeah. Con contracting is like, okay, so somebody's already decided what their problem is, how they want to solve it. They're just looking for the right body to come in and do the work. Consulting is, I bet you don't even know exactly what's going on. Let me do the research. Let me figure out what's going on. And then I will propose a solution to you. And when I went to my, my boss and, and talked to her about this, she was like, oh, heck no, no, no. I tried doing consulting a number of years ago. It was a total flop. I am not going down that path. And yet something inside me was saying, oh, no, you've got to go pay it forward and help people to do the same thing you did years ago. Right. And so one day I looked at her and said, I'm sorry, but I got to go. If I can't do this here, I've got to go create it myself. And she wasn't happy about it, but she understood. And she wasn't willing to stop saying no. So it was time for me to move on into this next phase, starting my own business and creating a consultant network. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, tell us about this. This this was this is amazing, ladies and gentlemen. You got to hear what she did here. So tell us how you put this together. 
it was it was actually taking all of these experiences that I had had in the last 10 years and figuring out how to put them together. Because that was the very cool thing is that, you know, once you step onto a more spiritual path, the universe will, if you cooperate, it will give you the pieces to your puzzle. And that's what I recognized here. So as I started going back out to people that I knew had recently been laid off, we were doing having massive layoffs in, in the Raleigh-Durham area at the time. You know, the big guys, the IBMs and the Nortels of the world were just dumping all these amazing people into uh, the out of their place and into the community. And so I gathered up a lot of these folks and said, look, I figured out how to be a consultant. You can too. And I'm going to help you figure out how to do that. And so because of my time as a recruiter, first of all, I had a number of companies I already had relationships with. And I had been part of a recruiter network that worked very much like a multiple listing service does for realtors. Mm -hmm. This was a network where people would have candidates and people would have job orders and they put them together through an electronic system and then they would split the fees. And so I had this relationship of recruiters all across the country now, which was a huge advantage. And I went back to them because we were in this downturn, this economic downturn at the time. And a lot of the recruiters all of a sudden weren't making the permanent placements they were making before. And I said, look, if you've got clients here in the Raleigh-Durham area, I've got consultants. All I need you to do is open doors for me. And I said, these consultants are going to pay me a commission. If I get them in the door and they land a project, I can split that commission with you. And all of a sudden, I had recruiters all over the country that were opening doors to me into VP offices <laughs> all over the triangle. And I was finding opportunities where my consultants could go in, do the same thing I did in that first time, go in, do the data gathering, find out what was really needed, and then be able to offer themselves. And then they were paying me a referral fee. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. In uh, I in my life, I, I did a lot with uh, uh, the regional bell companies, mm -hmm. and when they were going to deregulate, they laid off tons and tons of people, right? So there's big gaping holes. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in Birmingham, Alabama, with Bell South, and it was a group that I, we were working with, and 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 when in those areas, big companies, they got to offer it across the board at a certain level, right? They can't pick and choose. So right. from this level, you're offered this. And I remember telling these people that we were working with, if you take the out package on Friday, I'll put you on my payroll on Monday and you'll go right back into that same place and do the same job. Yeah. And so these companies still need that skill. These people already know what they're doing. Did you find that as an avenue? That was part of it, uh, very definitely, because there were there were several people that that was what we recommended to them. Uh, you know, we knew that there was a demand for their skills, and it was like if you're not getting in there as an employee, go back to those companies you've interviewed with and offer yourself as an independent consultant. Mm -hmm. You know, you already know where their pain is you already have an idea of how you can help them. Just say, hey, look, if you don't want me as a permanent employee, look, I heard you talk about this, this, and this. I could do this, this, and this for you. What do you think? Is there something to talk about? Is there just a project I could do for you right now? Right. And that actually ended up being part of my story as well. One of the companies that did not hire me, I ended up a year later going back to them as the independent consultant and did a project with them. Mm -hmm. So you're right. That's, that is, uh, you know, anytime we get into that economic downturn, uh, that is the first thing I tell people is where have you interviewed? Go back and talk to Go them. Go back. Exactly. <laughs> this one vice president of Bell South told me, Shan, he said, I'll even pay these people a higher base salary because I don't have to pay payroll tax. I don't have to have worker comp. I don't have to have this. I don't have to have all these additional things. 
they're not a burden to the bottom line. And for whatever reason, consulting money seems to be easier to get than employee money. Is that what you find? Yeah, because it comes out of a different bucket. And that's where, you know, it's really important for people who are pursuing the independent consulting path to really learn how to think in terms of ROI. Because if you can be able to communicate uh, with a manager about how, you know, hiring you for a specific project will bring him a return on that investment, now that can come out of a completely different budget than my employee hiring budget. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely. Different set of rules with HR and all kinds of interesting things. Yeah, That's incredible. (laughs) So then you've got this nice business going. And then you told me your husband decides he wants to run for governor of North Carolina. (laughs) And in this process, you discovered some startling facts about the U.S. healthcare. What did you learn? What did you do? Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, my husband decided that he wanted to do this because we'd we'd had some things uh, as we'd gone along in our path together where we had just become aware of some seriously broken systems out here. And, you know, one of the things that we love to do was uh, we used to go into our high schools and and work with kids who had uh, interest in entrepreneurship. uh, And yet the schools would never allow uh, us to have an uh, entrepreneurship after school program. It's like, how crazy is that? There's all these kids who want this. So we're sitting there looking at these gaps in the education system. We're looking at these gaps in the healthcare system. And of course we were looking at all these because he decided to run for governor as an independent. So, you know, we said, Hey, you know, there's some good in both parties But we see the ability to take some of that good of both sides and be a middle ground and be able to create real solutions instead of this bat and back and forth, all the stuff like happens in our systems all the time. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it was interesting because, first of all, he ran into so many roadblocks as an independent. We found out that in North Carolina, if he had been a Republican or a Democrat, he only needed 5,000 signatures to get on a ballot. Because he was an independent, he would have had to have had 100,000. He could. (laughs) We're going to maintain the status quo one way or another here, right? That's exactly it. That's exactly it. We, We were not able to get him into the gubernatorial debates. They wouldn't allow him. Uh, a young man actually interviewed him from uh, from a major TV station. And then when the young man went back to uh, his superiors with the interview, they're like, we can't run that. We're, we're never going to run that. Even, even though the young man was like totally excited. They loved my husband's platform and everything he was about. But yeah, that was part of what we did during his campaign was we were trying to shine the light on things that were broken. And the healthcare system, most people aren't even aware of this. And we're talking about pre-pandemic. It may even be worse now. But pre-pandemic, the U.S. spends more money on healthcare than any other country in the world. But when you look at our results, we rank about number 40. Really? How can that be? That doesn't Mm -hmm. even make sense does not make sense. I mean, our our neighbors to the north, Canada, they rank 10th. And, you know, it's like, wow, okay, maybe we we do need to go learn something up there or something. But, you know, that was one of the things that that we found as part of what we're calling the broken systems. Mm -hmm. Um, The education system, equally broken. Because for one, Uh, You know, again, we found that there were a lot of young people who wanted to learn about entrepreneurship, but in their schools, they weren't receiving much opportunity to do that. And there's a lot of kids who are leaving high school with no clue what they want to do. And here's another statistic that blew our minds. And I know this because I've sat in the colleges and heard them tell me this directly. There are way too many colleges in this country that only went with all the freshmen that walk in the front door, only 40% of them ever graduate. Mm -hmm. 
40%. That is atrocious. <laughs> and, you know, again, broken systems. We're trying to cram kids into college that, you know, don't want to be there, aren't prepared to be there, don't know what they want to do. I had a guy get into a fight with me about that statistic. And he says, well, in our school, if, if they go for six or seven years, we get to 52% graduation. And I'm like, 52, we're going to be excited about that? About six or seven years for a four-year degree? <laughs> And now they have got uh, $200,000 in debt that they're never going to get out of. Yes. And, you know, so those are the kinds of things that we became really, really aware of. Not to mention that we also found out some of the most brilliant business minds are sitting in prison because there was nothing in terms of legal entrepreneurship being taught to them in their schools. So they went to the streets and learned the wrong kind. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we shined the light on a whole lot of stuff. And it was really funny because some of the big guys who were in the two parties started stealing our material and using it in their campaigns. <laughs> yeah, that seems to be the practice. <laughs> so now you've got, you basically, Shailene, you create, you know, have an economic development business. Yes. And you have a community development business. So you have two separate entities. Is that right? That is correct. We have uh, what we call economic development is Triangle Solutions Alliance. And that is all about bringing together those teams of consultants who can help to create more economic prosperity, either by going into a big corporation and fixing some of the stuff that's not working so well. There's a reason that it's been called the great resignation in the last year or so, right? Yes, exactly. Or they also get involved in helping more people to start businesses because that's the other side. You know, we have a team right now in Triangle Solutions who's putting together a pre-apprenticeship program to get more young people involved in the trades but we also are meshing in teaching them about entrepreneurship because a lot of tradespeople like the idea of providing a skill set to people. And then if they want to go and start their own business and come back as a subcontractor, just like we were just talking about, they like that idea. Exactly. So, so that's, that's what we do with the economic development side. Mm -hmm. And then We Care Partnerships Network is more of our community development side. And so that's where we're bringing together wellness professionals, prosperity professionals, peace and justice professionals, and bringing them into collaboration teams so that now they can get involved in not just brainstorming inside a company, but they can get involved in brainstorming in the community and engaging people in the community who are closest to the problems so that we can start to create solutions that some of those <clears throat> people who are supposedly hired to fix our problems don't really seem to want to fix. Exactly. Exactly. One of the things that, that I learned, Shan, was innovation and progress comes bottom up. Yes. It does not come from elected officials. It does not come from the boardroom down. It comes right. from the people who are closest to the situation, who are put in an environment where they're trusted and they're respected. And that's what you're doing here. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I remember one time we went into a high school and this was an entrepreneurship class. And I brought a business plan writing competition into the class where the kids could actually get involved in possibly winning cash for their business ideas. And it was really, really intriguing because the, the class decided to divide themselves up into six teams. So each team was, you know, competing in this business plan writing competition. And what was really mind blowing for me, because this was one of my earlier exposures to seeing this, was we had we had four teams that had a traditional for profit business that they wanted to create. But we had one team that was made up mostly of young men who were athletes. And these young men wanted to create a better kind of group home for boys. Hmm. 
it didn't take me too long to figure out these guys were starting to build based on their experiences and what they thought needed to be done better. There was another group in the, in the classroom that was a group of young girls and a lot of them were from Latino families and they were wanting to create a new type of domestic violence shelter for women of Hispanic descent. These were kids who were trying to put together the new ideas based on their experiences. But how often do we ever ask our young people for perspectives on these things? No. Not often enough. We don't, we don't. And we've got to a point, my daughter has a master's degree in education policy. And one of the things that makes her crazy is when the, when the shift came to everything's going to be college prep, everything's college prep. Mm-hmm. And she talked before my dad died, she was talking to my dad who worked in steel. And he had told her, you know, Sarah, the middle class in the booming years were worked steel. They were plumbers. They were road workers. They were construction people. That was the middle class. That's yeah. what made, that's what gave us the growth and the expansion and for whatever reason, we've, for lack of a better word, we've demonized that. Yes. And you have to have, you must take this path. And that's simply not the case. Everyone's path is different and everyone has different gifts. It, it is so true. So true. I mean, I'll never forget a few years ago, I was in a, in a prison in North Carolina and I was teaching about simple ways to start building your own income stream. And I mean, a guy just busted out crying during the class. And I was like, Oh my God, what did I do? You know, (laughs) what did I do wrong? And he's like, no, no, Miss Kramer, it's not you. He said, I just realized that if you were in my high school teaching me what you were, what you're teaching me now, I probably wouldn't be sitting in this prison. Exactly. Exactly. We had a similar type story, young man in jail. He had uh, became a drug dealer, he became very mm-hmm. successful. Yep. And, uh, and he was not even 19, 20. Mm-hmm. And we were talking to him and we said, so tell me what you did. He goes, well, I had an organization, I had salespeople, I had distribution people, I had protection people, I had this. And I remember saying to him, you know what you are? And he goes, no, I'm a criminal. And I went, no, no. You're a CEO. That's what a CEO does. You put an infrastructure together. Now we got to find something that's not socially unacceptable or illegal, but (laughs) you have the skills. Yes. Yes, absolutely. The most brilliant business minds are sitting in prisons. And I even had a young man right along that line who, who, uh, again, this was in a prison and he, he told me a similar story and I looked at him and I said, do you know that there actually is a legal business model that's exactly what you just described to me? And he said, what's that? And I jumped into a discussion about talking about direct sales and network marketing. I said, you had your whole network in the street. You had a whole network of distributors. I said, this is a legal business model and it has the ability to make as much money for you as what you were doing in the streets. And he just jumped out of that chair and he's like, why has nobody ever told me that? (laughs) Exactly. And this young man we spoke with said, and now I can sleep without a gun under my pillow. There you go. Different world. (laughs) Well, Shane, this has been amazing. This has just been an amazing conversation of what you the of of you getting hit with the two by four, but not staying down, getting up and moving forward. How do people get in touch with you, Shane? Well, some of the easiest way uh, right now is I'm definitely LinkedIn. I'm very active. Um, I'm pretty active on Facebook, uh, but I do have uh, the We Care Partnerships website, which is We Care Dash Partnerships. Dot com. And mm-hmm. right on the front of that page, we'll show you kind of the vision of the teams that we're building right now to be able to create a better world, basically, because I believe small business owners 
are the best problem solvers in the world. I believe that it's by us coming together and collaborating and being those imaginative problem solvers and engaging people in our communities that we're going to create more health, wealth, and peace in the world. So right on the front of that page is a form that somebody can fill out to let me know that they have interest in learning more of what we're doing. And we also have a little gift. If any of this sounds interesting, if somebody would be interested in just learning about, well, how do I start to create a solutions team in my community? You can go to getmyguide.info. And right there, getmyguide.info is a quick start guide to give you some ideas about how you could start to pull together your own solution team and start to do the change that we're looking for. Because, you know, it's all about first you got to be, then you got to do if you want to have. It's a lot of people I know have been working on being the change, but it's time to do the change. Be, do, and have. I love that. What a great way to end this. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, we're just about out of time. I want to thank Shan again. This, this is just an amazing story of courage, number one, to take a, a very extraordinary successful business career, but to have the courage to say, there's something more here. Even if, even if it was a two by four to had to hit you first, you still picked up the pieces and move forward. One, one author that I love, Shan, is, is Joseph Campbell. And he wrote one time, we must let go of the life we have planned so as to accept, accept the one that's waiting for us. Yes, exactly. So in other words, stop saying no. That's it. <laughs> Open your mind. Yeah. If you'd like more information about Cheyenne, she gave you a couple of websites so you can contact me and I will make sure it gets to her. You can see this show on Roku TV or on my YouTube channel, which is called Frank Zakari. And if you go to the YouTube, uh, please subscribe. I will also send, send links to Shayan so she can post this in all the areas that she posts her things and can keep moving forward with this program because this is what we really truly need at this time. And let me leave you with this, ladies and gentlemen, as I do every week. None of us are in this alone. And the secret to walking on water is to know where the rocks are. And today, Shayan showed us where many of those rocks are. Join me again next week. We look at another life altering event. Thank you again.